Uh, Genesis chapter 16, we're going to look at Genesis 16 through 18, at least the first half of chapter 18, and we're going to be continuing on. So far we've talked about uh, many things within the book of Genesis. We've talked about the creation of man. We've talked about the introduction, of, the, inter, the introducing of sin into the universe, the consequences of sin. We talked about how man fell before the flood, how man fell after the flood. We've talked about Noah and uh, the Tower of Babel. We talked about Abraham and uh, the introduction to Abraham. And now we're going to learn a little bit more about Abraham through Abraham chapter 16 through 18. And so this is going to be kind of interesting because here, of course, we're going to have the narrative of Abraham, uh, Sarah, and also Hagar and how that shapes the future through Genesis chapter, uh, well, Gen- through the entire, I guess, book of Genesis. And so it's going to be pretty interesting. The last class we dealt with... Um, Lot and how Lot was a threat to the covenantal promise. And the covenantal promise was is that God was going to give Abraham an offspring to be his heir. Well, Lot kind of stood in the way because Lot was kind of the adopted son, if you will, by Abraham because he left his father's house to go with his uncle Abraham to this land because Abraham had no, no sons, no, actually no children at all. And so Lot goes and does his own thing because he's wealthy and is rich and he doesn't need to be the uh, benefactor, I guess you would say, or the beneficiary of Abraham's fortune. And so now we're going to be introduced to the next issue in the, uh, the covenantal promise and that's going to be with Ishmael. And so chapter 16, 1 through chapter 18, 15 is going to be talking about the third years before Isaac is born. And that is the 13 years where Ishmael is born and raised in uh, Abraham's house. And so let's go ahead and let's look at verses 1 through 6 of Genesis chapter 16. Verses 1 through 6. Now Sari and Abram's wife had borne him no children, and she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, and it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of his, of his, of his wife Sarah. So Abraham had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, and Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt upon her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked at me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. And so here we have the story of how the barrenness of Sarah has caused somewhat of a rift between uh, the entire family. And so as we mentioned before in the last few classes, barrenness in the ancient world was extremely troubling for women. Their entire worth uh, was pretty much wrapped in on whether or not they could produce offspring and uh, hopefully male offspring. And so this oftentimes led to ridicule and rejection uh, by women who were not able to have children, even rejection from their own families. And so we can see from different marriage contracts from the ancient world, um, the Jewish rabbi said that if a man was married to a woman for 10 years and she bore him no children, uh, that was grounds for divorce. Um, in the ancient Near Eastern world, um, it was not grounds for divorce, but the, the practice here that Sarah does of bringing a slave to be a surrogate mother, if you will, to carry a child is extremely common. So when we read this in Genesis chapter 16, we think, well, that sounds so weird. I mean, that's just not something that is done. But in the ancient world, not only was this normal, but it was expected. The idea, if you were a woman, if you couldn't provide your husband with children, it was your obligation to find a woman who could bear him children. Oftentimes, the wife would have a slave, the husband would lay with the slave, have a child, and then the, the wife, the, uh, the one who was barren, would actually take that child and raise that child as her own, as if it was her own son, as if she carried it herself. Some cultures, the slave would be sold to somebody else. In the Code of Hammurabi, it said the slave could not be so. So it was kind of a way to safeguard the slave so they weren't used and then discarded just because they had born a son. In the Code of Hammurabi, they were still to be a slave, but there were some safeguards with their protection. And also that you just couldn't uh, get them pregnant and then just kind of throw them out and say, okay, you've done, you've done your job. And so oftentimes a woman's barrenness was seen as a, um, a punishment by God. Does Sarah equate that here does she equate the fact that the reason she can't bear children is because God has done this? 
Yeah, right. In Genesis 16, 2, right? She says that God has done this to me, right? God has withheld children from me. So she doesn't say, maybe I just can't have children. She says, no, God's done this, right? It's, it's God's, she doesn't say fault, but I mean, God's the one who's the one who's deciding whether or not I can get pregnant or not. And he's obviously said, I ain't have no kids. And so she says, maybe Hagar, my servant, will uh, be able to bear children. And so... Um, Hagar bears a son, and what happens to Hagar after she bears a son, after she gets pregnant? What, well, before that, before what does Hagar do? What does she, what does she do that, that raises the temperature in the household a little bit? Yeah, contempt, right? I mean, imagine yourself being a woman who's been married to your husband for, uh, I don't know how long they've been married, but God's promised that your husband was going to have a child, and 11 years has gone by, and the child has not come through you. You give him your servant, and within about a couple of months, she gets pregnant, and all of a sudden, she looks on you with contempt. You couldn't get pregnant, but I could. Didn't take me very long. You know, and not only is she, she's kind of rubbing it in. She's taking this idea that now she's, she's carrying the child of one of the richest, most influential men in this part of the world. And this got into her head a little bit. She no longer thinks of herself as a slave, but she's putting herself on the equal par with, um, with Sarah. And Sarah doesn't seem to appreciate this uh, very much. And so she's, uh, she's pretty upset about what takes place. And so uh, Sarah goes to Abraham and says, uh, she's not very happy, is she? All right. Now, is, is Sarah upset that Abraham has laid with Hagar? Well, she, she asks him to do that. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Is she upset the fact that Abraham has done this? <laughs> I think she was more upset that Hagar is... Yeah. Yeah, she's not upset. That's what I'm saying. She's not upset at all that Abraham has had sexual relations with Hagar. She's not upset at all. She's not upset at all that she's pregnant, right? She's upset that Hagar, now being pregnant, has forgotten her place. In fact, in the ancient Assyrian code, like I said, this was a common practice. And so there were actually laws that said, if the pregnant slave gets too haughty, what you're supposed to do, right? According to the ancient Assyrian text, they were supposed to put a quart of salt in their mouth and burn their mouths. Um, I guess the equivalent of, I guess, washing your mouth out with soap in the 21st century, you know. Anybody have their parents wash their mouths out with soap? I did. Bar soap. And to this day, I have no idea what I said. I guess I was too young to even know what I said. I guess I was just repeating something I'd heard, but I just remember getting my mouth washed out with soap. Anyways, it was like lava soap, too, you know, what even, even the good stuff. The stuff my dad washed his hands with from the fields. It was just nasty. It's a wonder I survived. But anyways. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Poor, poor boy. Yeah. Uh, um, do what? I guess. Like I said, I have no idea to this day what I even said. I asked my mom about that a couple years ago. She said, I never washed your mouth out with soap. It's like, yes, you did. I remember it. She's like, no, I didn't. She's she like, I didn't do that. It's like, it's like, yes, yes, you did. Um, and so um, the word is the same one, claw, the, the word that is used here for the contempt that Hagar has for Sarah. It's the same word that is used in Genesis 12, 3, where God tells Abraham, the one who dishonors you, I will curse. It's the same word there used for dishonored. It's also the same word used in Exodus 21, 17, where the law of Moses says that if a child uh, dishonors their parents, they're to be put to death. And so um, this was not just like, you know, Sarah got jealous because Hagar was pregnant. She wasn't. Evidently, Hagar had overstepped her bounds and was being uh, hateful to Sarah. And so Hera was, Sarah was upset at Abram because Abram evidently didn't stand up and say, all right, Hagar, like you're carrying my son, but you're going to have to tone it down a little bit. Like you've forgotten this is my wife, and yes, you're carrying my child, but you're also a slave. And so uh, Sarah says that Abraham has been complicit in Hagar's attitude and her actions. And so Sarah punishes Hagar, possibly even physically, uh, physical punishment uh, took place. As I mentioned before, according to the Code of Hammurabi and Old Assyrian texts, uh, there were actually laws for punishing a slave surrogate mother um, if she backed off. 
out uh, the, the wife of the house, if you will. And so Hagar sees that she's being mistreated. Maybe she's even fearing for the life of her child. And so she flees and she goes towards Egypt. And of course we know that she is a slave from Egypt. Uh, Abraham acquires her when he goes down into Egypt and Pharaoh gives him all kinds of servants and, and sheep and oxen and everything. One of those things that he gets is Hagar in that transaction. And so any questions or comments on verses 1 through 6? Yes, Steve. So my translation, the American Standard, it says that she gave him the husband of Abraham as his wife. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's not a real wife. It's like a concubine or a mistress. Right. Yeah, no, they weren't. Would, would that not have elevated her to the equal status of Sarah and not yeah. slavery? But it doesn't appear to have done so. She's still in Yeah. Yeah, there's, the thing is, there's no word for wife in Hebrew. It's just woman. And um, so, like, Malia is your woman. And so, that sets her apart from other women because she's your woman. Like I said, Hebrew, right? That's not, I'm just saying, you know. Um, and, and so, when it says gave, gave her to him, um, to be his woman? Well, to be what woman? Now, this interpretation, some would say, well, to be a wife or to be a concubine. The thing is, it just it doesn't say in the text. And so, um, it doesn't seem like she would have been a wife. In most, ancient, in most ancient customs that we know of, because of the laws on the books, the slave woman would not have been a wife. And after she got done carrying the child, she would actually go back to being a slave. She would... You know, would not even have an elevated status as being the one that actually created the child. As I mentioned before, I'm, we're taking Assyrian and Babylonian texts of the same time period, and Abraham and Sarah were from, you know, ancient Sumer. So it would have been, you know, Babylonian and Assyrian customs seem to be pretty close to the things that they actually do. Um, but it's, well, my next question, I guess, was that a sin for Abraham to do that? Yeah. I mean, I've got it. Um, or was it considered okay? That time under that dispensation or whatever. Yeah. You know, they allowed David and all these guys to have yeah. the woman they wanted, basically. Right. Well, even, even in... Adultery changed in the New Testament. Right. Well, even in Samuel, even when uh, uh, David takes Bathsheba to be his wife, you know, when God, sent, when God talks to David, he said, didn't I give you enough wives? And he said, and if you'd asked for more, I'd have given you more. And so... Um, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew 19 that from the beginning God intended for there to be one man and one woman. Now, you know, Jesus says to the hardness of, of your heart, Moses allowed you to get a, allowed you to, uh, get a divorce. We can see in the patriarchs uh, multiple wives. You can see that with Jacob. You know, uh, we know Isaac. And in fact, Philo would say that Isaac was the most pious of the patriarchs because he's the only one mentioned that doesn't have a concubine or an additional wife. Um, his love for Rebecca is purer than any of the other patriarchal loves. Anyways, long story short, don't know, Steve. I'm, it's a, sorry, it's a bad thing. It doesn't, God didn't tell him to do it. God said he's going to give him a son, and him and Sarah should have just waited on the Lord instead of taking matters into their own hands. Um, I don't think it was right uh, to do that. Abraham was to God and talking to God. What the mystery to me that he didn't ask or talk to God about this. It's such a serious matter. Well, I think one of the issues is a lot of times we think of the patriarchs as having an open dialogue with God. And in the uh, 100 years of Abraham's life, he only talks to Abraham eight times. Yeah. And so um, oftentimes we think of the, all the patriarchs had it so good. They could just talk to God anytime they wanted to. That never happened. Um, uh, it was very sporadic. Like I said, Abraham was the father of the faithful, and he only got talked to eight times in 100 years. And oftentimes, the revelations we have are very small. And even asking about what happened in this situation is a good question, because if you look at Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, when God tells Abraham, you're going to have a son, does he ever mention Sarah's name? No, he doesn't mention it in Genesis 12 or Genesis 15. He says, you're going to have a son and never mention Sarah's name. And so, you know, Sarah and Abraham have been waiting for 11 years and their patience has grown thin. And they think, well, Abraham, you've got to have a son. That's what God said. Well, let's, let's make it happen. And so I think the danger here is, is not, you know, if God says it's going to take place, you know, it's going to happen. He doesn't really need your help. But at the same time, 
we've all heard that sermon where the preacher used the illustration of somebody sitting on top of the housetop and they send a car and they send a boat and they send a plane and you get to heaven and he says, you know, Lord, you're supposed to save me. He's like, what do you want me to do? I send a car, boat, a plane. You know, but here, you know, it seems that the role was reversed, right? And Abraham should have took the role into his own hands. And we're going to see that play out in Genesis 17 and 18. Miss Joy? Did the one carrying the child have anything to do with raising the child? Or did they just give it over to the... Beyond nursing, no. Uh, beyond nursing, no. Miss mm. Susan? What did Sarah mean when she said the Lord judged between me and you? Yeah. What she's trying to say is that Abraham is guilty of not living up to his status as the, the head of the household and making and putting Hagar in her place. Evidently, Abraham is waiting for a child for so long. He's so happy that Hagar is pregnant that he's letting her get away with. Sarah's saying, you know she's mistreating me. and You know this is wrong, and you haven't done anything about that. Um, and she's calling God as a witness, kind of say. She said she was wrong also. Well, I think she's saying, like, her, she's been wronged by Hagar. Like, she's saying that I've been wronged is your fault because you had the power to stop it. Not, that, not, the, not the conception, but the idea that Hagar is looking upon her with content. That he's, I mean, we're talking about a time and place where the paraphernalia is determined whether somebody lived or died. I mean, like, that's, like I mentioned before, like, in, even in ancient Rome, like, like, you know, wouldn't like, you know, Daddy didn't have no authority. Like, you know, whether you got to live or, you know, you know, mama, you know, I, I made you, I, I brought you in this world, I can take you out. Like, those are funny words today. 4,000 years ago, those are serious words. Like, that, that's, that's real stuff. That matters. Uh, yes, for Rick. Uh, it looks like um, Abram was uh, sort of harsh and critical of uh, Hagar because she said she was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, even after burying him a son, he wanted for such a long period of time. Yeah. Well, I mean, Brother Rick, you're trying to get me in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> I choose my words carefully. William Shakespeare said, <laughs> you know. Um, I think Sarah is really upset, and I think Abraham does what most men would do in the situation. Hun honey, you take care of it. Whatever you want. You know, like, whatever, it's in your hands now. Whatever you say, the servants will do. And I think that's kind of what, I think that's what we see. In, I, think we see I think we see Abraham's weakness in verse 5 and verse 6. We see his weakness in not stopping Hagar's attitude and how she's treating Sarah. And then we see his weakness in verse 6 by just kind of washing his hands in the matter and saying, well, honey, you just do whatever you think is best. You know, and of course... I mean, human, hu, humans haven't changed, have they? Uh, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, I don't know. I haven't talked to any of them, but... Um, I bet it is interesting. We'll just leave it at that. Um, here is Newsy that you can see here. This is an ancient city. The reason why this city is so important, Abraham would have been around Ur. Ur is going to be south of Babylon. So like I said, this is a similar place, similar time, similar customs. And we know from the marriage contracts that have been preserved in the cuneiform there in Newsy about this. I've been talking about the ancient materials that talk about the marriage contracts. And in the marriage contracts, like it says, and it's honestly, it's really interesting to see how detailed marriage contracts are from 4,000 years ago. Um, even more so than even ours today. But in those marriage contracts, it says that, you know, um, if, if John marries um, Jill and Jill doesn't bear a son in five years, John can take a slave from the land of Lulu and he can have a, and and she's to provide him a son. You know, like it, it says it in the like when they get married, it's like, honey, you can't bear kids. This is this is this is in the contract. You know, I could I can go get a slave woman and, and have a son, have a kid. And so um, interesting stuff uh, for certain. And so let's look at let's see uh, uh, God and Hagar here in verses six through 17. 
The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, and the springs on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sari, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. To the, Lord, to the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring, so that you cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall shall be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all of his kinsmen. And so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Be'ir Laharoi, and it seems between it lies between Kadesh and Berid. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old, and Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And so, one of the interesting things here, Hagar is pregnant and she flees and she travels about 70 miles. Uh, Brittany's pregnant and uh, she's tough. Do what? In case you didn't know, um, Brittany's pregnant and uh, her traveling 70 miles on foot um, seems almost impossible, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's hard for a pregnant lady. And so, but this woman is determined to get back to her people, and she's trying to get there. And then she sees the angel of the Lord. Now, many people have asked the question, who's the angel of the Lord? Occurs several times in the Old Testament, and there are some people who feel very strongly about who the angel of the Lord is. Is it a special angel? Is it the pre-incarnate Christ? Many people believe that whenever they see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is the pre-incarnate Christ. Um, this goes all the way back to Justin Martyr, who lived in the second century, and so about 100 years after the establishment of the church. It was born out of a, a hermen, it was not born out of hermen, hermeneutics where you look at the Old Testament and say, oh, I see certain strands here that makes me think that it's Jesus. The reason it was done is because uh, Justin Martyr and early Christian apologists were trying to show the Jewish people uh, the triune God in the Old Testament because the Jews were calling Christians uh, polytheists. You believe in multiple gods. You believe there's a, a Father God, a Son God, and a Holy Spirit God. You know, and that goes against the very first command, like the first commandment that goes against everything the Old Testament has to say. And Justin Martyr was like, no, 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 Jesus is in the Old Testament. You can see him in the Old Testament. And he was trying to connect the angel of the Lord. This became very popular. There were those like Athanasius and Augustine that kind of pushed back on this idea. But it became a very popular idea throughout Christianity uh, ever since the, uh, the second century. Uh, but one of the problems with that is, is that oftentimes they'll say, well, look at the first person deity, because whenever the angel of the Lord speaks, he speaks as if he's God. He uses first person pronouns. You know, I will bless you. I will curse you. The problem is, if you look at the prophets, they do the exact same thing, because they're prophets. They're God's spokesmen. They're speaking for God. And so they use first person pronouns. And so um, even you'll see them switch back and forth between first and third person pronouns. And so uh, they judge. Judges 2 and 6 are some of the passages that are used to say, well, the angel of the Lord accepts worship. Well, uh, 2 and 6 are kind of ambiguous. The reason why they some, some, some think that Judges chapter 6 talks about sacrifice is the Hebrew word minha, which means gift or sacrifice, because Gideon brings a minha. And so, and even then it's questionable if the angel of the Lord even accepts that worship, or if he just touches it with his staff, and then of course the fire comes up. And so, I think this draws back to the importance of messengers in the ancient world. We we have mass communication, and so we are so spoiled. I can take my phone, I can call friends in Germany and Italy. I mean, I can call Saha right now and put them on FaceTime, and you guys can see them. I mean, we just we are spoiled to death when it comes to communication. In the ancient world, a royal messenger was to be feared, to be treated, to be received, respected. The same way that you would the actual person they represented. If you had Caesar's royal messenger walk through these doors, he should be treated as if Caesar himself. You know, and if he decrees Caesar's words, he's going to say, I, you know, I'm going to come with my army in two months if you don't surrender, and I'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth. Right? Well, it's not that dude, you know. He's just a messenger, but he's speaking for Caesar there. And so the, the importance of the ancient royal messenger sometimes helps with this. And so... It's just interesting. We can see this that take place in Genesis 44, 5, and 10. Joseph sends a messenger. The messenger talks to his brothers, and he says, you know, Benjamin's going to become my servant. He's not talking about 
him. He's talking about Joseph back in uh, the royal city. And so Moses does this exact same thing in Deuteronomy 29, 2-6, when he's talking about the law of the people. It's not Moses who's going to curse the people, but it's actually God himself. Uh, Haggai is called the angel of the Lord in, um, in Haggai one thirteen, Some of your English translations will actually change that to messenger of the Lord. But the actual Hebrew is the exact same thing. Uh, angel means messenger. And so it's the same same word. And so depending on the the context and what's going on, that angel could be a man. It could be an actual supernatural being. Uh, uh, so anyways, that's just a kind of an excursus on is it Christ, is it an angel, is it a man, um, and what it is. And I think that's kind of an interesting discussion because many people will ask, who's the angel of the Lord and what is the significance in the Old Testament and who is he? And so, but anyways, God blesses Hagar and Ishmael and says, you know, I'm going to bless him. Don't worry. Go back to Sarah. Go back to Abram. You know, I know that you're being mistreated, but everything's going to be okay because I've already given your son a name and a future. And so if God has given him a name and he's given him a future, then she knows that he's going to be fine uh, no matter how bad it is at home. And so Hagar shows her faith and she goes back uh, to Abram and Sarah. Then Ishmael means uh, God hears. And so, any questions or comments on verses 7 through 16 of chapter 16? Uh, Jim? I was, just what you just said, the uh, Hebrew name Ishmael, uh, I Googled it and said, God listens. Yeah. Yeah, uh, God listens, God hears. Um, and the reason why is because evidently God had heard Hagar's cries, her affliction, her her pain. He had heard her pain. And so that's why he's called Ishmael. Good. Why 11 and 12? Okay. The angel of the Lord said to her, sound like he's telling her this kid's going to be bad. Okay, uh, when he talks about him being a wild donkey, uh, what, the, what he's talking about there is the nature of the lifestyle that he's going to live. And when he says that is, uh, there, there's going to be unending conflict between the descendants of Ishmael, in which they've always been warring tribes in the Middle East. Um, uh, a large portion of Arabians uh, have their lineage back to Ishmael. And of course we know about that. But when he talks about a wild donkey, a wild donkey is kind of like... Uh, it's our version, I guess you would say, of a, of a Mustang in the um, in the middle in the Midwest, and so they're a nomadic people. Like they're no, like they never have a home. They're always on the move. They're always on the go. They're always searching for a sustainable place for a season. They never they never stay down for one place. And throughout the Old Testament, you see whenever Ishmael and his descendants are mentioned, they're they're migrants. They're caravanners. They're um, they're always on the move. They're nomads. Also, unbroken, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, are they actually connected with Islam? Um, they're they're the people of of most Islamic people today can trace their lineage, their physical lineage back to um, Ishmael, and so in fact that's one of the one of their. Uh, they claim to worship the God of Abraham because they actually trace their, their lineage back to Ishmael. And, um, and so, yeah, I think when it says, you know, his hand against everybody, everybody's hands against him, um, you know, the Arabians for much of history have always been kind of a warring people. I mean, even when, you know, the powers of the United States and, and Great Britain and France and, you know, after World War I and World War II, you know, we went to the Middle East and kind of, you know, established boundaries and made countries. And, okay, you guys are going to be Iraq and you're going to be Saudi Arabia and this prince is going to be in charge. And, and they were fighting before then. They've been fighting ever since. They just never, you know, they've been fighting for 4,000 years. Uh, and um, I don't know if it's true or not. Somebody said they were fighting when Christ came the first time. They'll be fighting when Christ came the second time. And I'm only 27 years old, but it seems like that might be a true statement. I don't know. Um, so, good questions. Uh, yes? Is this the um, first angel here? This is the first time where uh, it's the angel of the Lord is mentioned as the angel of the Lord. That's right. This is the first time. Good. Good catch. Good comment. I'm afraid that when the angels come and tell them they're going to No. Mm -mm. Good. Good. 
Any other questions or comments? All right, good. You guys are great. And so here, uh, you can kind of see on the map, um, the first star is in Hebron, which is where Abraham lives. And you can see the 70 mile trek that Hagar makes trying to get back to Egypt. And so 140 mile round trip for a pregnant woman is pretty, pretty harsh, but she does that. It would take her at least two weeks, maybe longer to go on this trip. So pretty hard stuff. Chapter 17 is an interesting chapter because in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, we have the covenant. But each time God gives it, it gets a little bit more detail each time. Uh, Genesis 12, he says, if you'll go to this land, I will bless you. Genesis 15, he says, I'm going to establish my covenant with you and I'm going to be faithful to you. Genesis 17, he adds both promises, but he also adds some requirements of the covenant. He adds uh, in the promises, he promised him that he'll be a father of many nations, which is the first time he said that to Abraham. He says, you'll, your descendants will be kings. The covenant is to be everlasting. And so these three things are not mentioned in Genesis 12 or 15. But one of the things that is also mentioned that I wasn't mentioned before is the moral obligations. Before, God hasn't given any moral obligations to Abraham. In Genesis 15, he says that you, if you leave and go to this new land, I'll bless you. But here in Genesis 17, he says you're going to have to be blameless. right? You're going to have to keep some moral obligations if this covenant is going to be um, ongoing, I guess you would say. Uh, the Hebrew word here, olam, for everlasting, is not eternity. Um, and it's, it's a hard word to translate because a lot of times when we see everlasting, we think of, you know, eternal. But what this means is ongoing uh ongoing perpetuity like it's just it's an ongoing thing that's not going to change until it needs to change like this thing will never stop until it needs to needs to stop because you have not upheld your end of the bargain or vice versa one of the ways we can see this is this is the same word that is used uh, for the land promises for Israel in Israel you would have this land forever ongoingly but we can see we don't make it out halfway out of the Old Testament and that doesn't happen right the Babylonians come in and take everything and so they were unfaithful, and so that everlasting, that olam, ended uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses uh, 22. Hannah tells the Lord, you know, my son will, will, live, will stay in your temple, you know, olam. Well, Samuel doesn't stay in the temple for eternity, right? He's still not in the temple, right? He's not even, not even there, you know, or the tabernacle. And so... He didn't stay in the tabernacle his entire life. You know, it was just, but you're saying, you know, he's going to stay there until, you know, you determine that this is going to change for some way. You're going to be in charge. And so this word is used many times in the Old Testament, but never, very, very few times that ever used in the idea of eternity like we see it. Sometimes people see everlasting, how it's translated olam, as I said before in the Hebrew, and they, they don't understand the difference between the two. Um, then we have the promise of Isaac. And it's interesting here that Isaac is a... Uh, um, oh, uh, one interesting thing is that uh, circumcision is said to be everlasting. And, and we're not, we can't read chapter 17 for our time, but circumcision is supposed to be a sign between God's people everlasting. Well, we know from the New Testament, Colossians 2, 8-15, through 15, that Paul explicitly says that's not valid anymore. Well, many have said, how can that not be valid you know, Genesis 17 says everlasting. Because what I just told you, right? does it mean from the start of time to the end of time? It just means until the foreseeable future, until it changes. Um, and of course, in Colossians 2, 8 through 15, Paul actually says circumcision has been replaced by something else. Anybody know what he says? Baptism, Baptism right? Circumcision of not of the hands, right? Not of the flesh, right? But putting of the old, old flesh, like the old man of sin. And so um, the Arianic priesthood, you know, God tells Aaron that his, his uh, descendants are going to be priests forever, right? Olam. Well, Hebrews chapter 6 through Hebrews chapter 10 makes it explicit that priesthood is no longer valid, right? Because now we have a better high priest. Who's that? Christ, right? Absolutely. And so then we have the promise of Isaac. And let's look at verses 15 through 21. We'll read, we'll read those verses. Of chapter 17. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah 
shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, and an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and make him a fruitful, and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And so God informs him for the first time that Sarah is going to be the mother of the promised son. As I mentioned before, he's promised him an offspring 13 years ago, right? But he's never mentioned Sarah before. He now says, Sarah is going to bear you a child. She's going to be the mother of many nations. She's going to be the mother of kings, right? And so what does Abraham do? He, got the laugh. he laughs, right? Which is interesting because what does Isaac mean? Laugh. Right, laughter, right? He laughs, laughter, right? That's why I'm so funny, guys. See, <laughs> see how that works. I appreciate you laughing and, and, and uh, helping my ego a little bit. Thank you. Um, but, um, but he laughs. What does Abraham want? What does he want? Yeah, he wants God to accept Ishmael, right? I mean, God says, I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham says, thanks, but no thanks. I don't need a son. I've got Ishmael. I mean, imagine leaving your home, your father's house, because God says, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you a son. And here you are living in that land, wealthy, fat, and happy, but no son. But eventually you do have a son. And for 13 years, Ishmael's 13, for 13 years you look at that son and he's your hopes, he's your dreams, he's got all your love. You look at him and you know that God's given him to you to carry on your name. He's going to, he's going to bless that son with a covenant. I mean, Abraham's probably taught to Ishmael about God and about the covenant. And all of a sudden, Ishmael's 13 years old. I mean, this is, this is manhood in the ancient world. And God says, oh, by the way, this son that you've been petting for 13 years, this son that you've been training to carry on your legacy and your name, this son that's going to carry on the covenant in your mind, it's not going to happen. I mean, anybody in here got kids? Anybody got in here kids about 13? All right? I mean, Im imagine yourself in that situation. For 13 years, this has been your world. Only child, right? This is why you left home. And God says, ain't him. I mean, think about that. Abraham says, I don't, I don't need another son. He says, no, you're going to have one. This, just because you thought this was going to be the way the game was going to play out, it's not the way I intended it. Right? Sometimes we have the same ideas. Sometimes we tell God, no, that's okay. I've taken care of my own way. And God says, not so fast. Right? It's not, it's not the way the game's going to play out. And so uh, he also tells them, uh, Abraham, that he's going to have to circumcise everyone in his house, all of his descendants, um, all those uh, who are bought, all those who are slaves. And so he tells them to sacrifice them in the eight days. Uh, many uh, articles have been written on the science of the eight day. Um, that is when the vitamin K and the prothrombin, is that right? are the highest. It's the only time where both of those are over 100%, and so it gives a much higher chance for the blood to clot and for the babies not to die um, whenever the circumcision takes place. And so uh, there was a study that was done on this in the 1940s and published. Um, before then, I don't think there was any scientific study about vitamin K and prothrombin uh, and circumcision on the eighth day, uh, but uh, that was about 4,000 years after God told Abraham to do that, which is interesting. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting that these things are replaced. Um, there are two new signs of the covenant that are given under the New Testament. What are those two? Nobody wants to say it because it's on the board, right? Yeah. All right? What's the first one? Baptism. What's the second one? Can you know the abbreviation for LS? Lord's Supper. Right? In Luke 20, ver 22, verse 20, Jesus, this is my blood of the new covenant, right? Take this remembrance of me. 
And then he goes on, and you can see in uh, Colossians 2, 8 through 15, and Acts 2, 2, 28, that baptism, right, is now the new sign of the covenant. Um, and so it's interesting here that circumcision was the initial entrance into the covenant, and keeping the law was going to be the continuation of keeping that covenant. Well, we also have an initiation into the covenant, which is by baptism, which is exactly why Paul says, we have a circumcision today. We have a covenantal sign. I mean, read Colossians 2, 8 through 15. You cannot read Colossians 2, 8 through 15 and think baptism is not essential. Because Paul says, you had to be circumcised under the old law to be a Jew, to be under the covenant. We have a new covenantal sign. And it is a circumcision. But it's not a fleshly circumcision. It's a circumcision of, of the old man of sin and death. Um, and you can see that also uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it comes to the Lord's Supper. And so, uh, interesting passages there. We don't have time to look at chapter 18. We'll catch that next week. But some takeaways that we have. Anybody have any questions quickly on uh, chapter 17? Rick? Uh, why would there be a covenant that only allowed men to be a part of that? Uh, for circumcision, and that the Jews were not allowed to be a part of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, today, women can be baptized today, and they can be the Lord's Supper. Yeah. That's one time, all the men were the only people that were qualified to accept or be part of that covenant. Yeah, one of the sad things is many people read the New Testament and think that it's chauvinistic and that puts women down. Uh, but actually, Christianity brings women to an elevated stat status they did not enjoy in the ancient world, especially in Judaism. Um, which is one of the things that why Paul talks about that. I mean, one of the reasons why you get the talking of, of Paul in Galatians 3, the connection between Galatians 3, 27 and 28, where Paul talks about there being no longer male nor female, you know, Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, you know, is, is, and it's a passage talking about baptism is right there. And, um, and so it's because it was a sign. Baptism, there's a symbol that goes with the sign. And circumcision, the sign is, and like I said before last week, this is an adult class, and our time's running out, so we'll be quick, okay? Circumcision was to be a sign, because God said, I'm going to be, you're going to be fruitful and multiply. And so, whenever they saw the male genitalia, it was a sign that God sees your male genitalia, and He's going to bless you, and you're going to be fruitful and multiply and have lots of kids. Like, this is a symbol. And so there's a sign to the symbol. Just like in baptism, is there a sign to the symbol? Right? You guys have all seen the charts, right? Where you go down, right? You know, live, you're buried. Post signify what? Right? Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection, right? Same thing, right? There's a it's not just it's not an arbitrary, unless there's some skin, let's just cut that thing off there. You know what I'm saying? It'll make us different from everybody else. It's like, no. There's a, there's, a, there's a point to it. There's a symbol. There's a sign with it. Same thing as baptism. And so that's why. Uh, good question. Good question. Good. All right. And so some takeaways, signs of the covenant, as I mentioned before, there are still signs of the covenant today, and that is the initial uh, one, which is baptism, the continuation, which is the Lord's Supper. Um, Jews were so proud of circumcision because they could look back and say, Abraham was circumcised. Isaac was circumcised. Jacob was circumcised. When I was circumcised, when I circumcised my sons, they're taking part of a, a 2,000 year tradition that Abraham took part of. When we're baptized, we're taking part of a 2,000 year tradition where every Christian, every person in Christ that's ever been was baptized into Christ just like you were. It is a sacred covenantal sign. Um, it is a shame it has been downplayed so much in the modern world because it is a wonderful thing. The exact same thing with the Lord's Supper. When you think about the idea that since the church was established in Acts chapter 2, that every seven days people have gathered together in the name of Christ to partake of unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. I mean, I mean, this is weird to think about this, but if you track it back, like the people who were alive when you were kids, if you were members of the Lord's Church, right? Okay, they were 80 when you were six. But at one point, they were six, right? And there were people in their congregation who were 80, right? And it's theoretical, and it probably does, it breaks down at some point. But there's an unending chain because it takes place every week. God's people meet together to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so when we meet together every first day of the week, it's this beautiful thing of communion where 
this unending broken tradition for 2,000 years. I mean, it's, it's special. This is something incredible. And uh, it's, it's, it's sad that people flippantly were like, oh, people have been doing this for 1,800 years without stopping? Let's do it once a quarter so it'll mean more to us. You know, it's like, if it doesn't mean enough to you taking it every week, you take it once every 10 years. It don't matter. You know, because it's a heart issue. It's not a how many times we do it in a month issue. I mean, it's, you just don't understand what the significance of it is. And so, I'm preaching now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the importance of a name. Um, they were supposed to uh, honor the names that God had given them. We're supposed to honor them in Christ. Piggybacking off of our uh, adult class Sunday morning. And then nothing's too hard for God. And that, we'll talk about that next week. We'll look at Genesis chapter 18. And so, uh, thank you so much for your comments and for your questions. And uh, I realize we're a couple minutes past time. So, we'll go ahead and we'll close the prayer. Thank you so much. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings that you've given us. We're so thankful for the heritage that we have uh, in Christ and in servants like Abraham and Isaac and other patriarchs. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the knowledge that these individuals weren't perfect, but through their lives they grew and became more faithful uh, with different trials and tests that they had to live through. And dear Heavenly Father, we realize that we are not perfect, but we also realize that there will be trials and tests in our life, and we hope that we will trust in you and that our faith will grow and that we can become stronger uh, in our faith. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to take pride and to see the significance of the signs of the covenant today between a baptism and the Lord's Supper and help us to see these things not as empty rituals, uh, but things to bring about a reminder and a faith in you and your word and uh, your wisdom. And please watch over us and help us to be a congregation that loves you, loves your word, and loves people around us. And please be with us each and every day. In your son, we pray. Amen.